uh, Coach Ivan, it's really good to have you in Dublin. So welcome. We spent a few days together, but uh, it's fantastic to have you uh, in the studio recording a podcast. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So uh, we've done a podcast before. So we've done an episode and people can find it and we can link it for people. And we spoke a lot about the Suplex training systems. And I think anybody who finds this video and watches this video, they will probably know who you are to a certain extent they'll be familiar with the suplex training systems with all the equipment but today what i really want to talk about is people within the suplex training system is the coaches and people who take charge of those tools and um and the first question i have for you is what brought you to coaching because you had a, quite a rapid transition from being a top level athlete to then slotting into the coaching role so how that tra- how did that transition happen how did you get into coaching yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, mostly what I what I felt like got me into coaching is that I was effective with athletes by giving my basic instructions. Um, for example, I was the uh, first time I felt the coaching, um, the real coaching, like in giving instructions to athletes uh, versus just to wrestle and just show some moves is when I was invited um, at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, United States, to be uh, just a clinician, technician. Um, uh, my friend Steve Frazier brought me, who was a national coach at that time, brought me from Bulgaria to Colorado Springs, and they had their national, um, they call it January camp, it was an annual camp they were doing. And he put me there and uh, they asked me to, to show my top techniques that I've been scoring, been effective. And um, I've been showing just my stuff. Um, I wasn't trained to show moves, especially in English. But I realized after the clinic, after that camp, um, guys been asking about me and uh, they were talking good things about me, positive things that I, I break things down and explain very well. And um, I saw myself effective, and I that, that kind of like made me think about, oh, maybe maybe I should consider coaching as like I should study this. Uh, and that's 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 the first time I experienced like interest in coaching. And what, was it almost like a surprise to yourself that you you were that effective, uh, or did you have that inkling already? Did you feel like you could you could do something? I didn't know what to think. I I. I knew I uh, uh, the stuff that I was showing, I have a good understanding because I was coached by good coaches. So I was adding what I knew from my coaches. But um, when you hear when you hear positive things, and when you when athletes are asking about you, can you be on my corner? Can you watch how I wrestle? Can you show me this again? It tells you that you're effective, you know. And 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 um, the other thing about coaching, I, I discover later. Uh, I was just, I was just willing to help athletes um, without any payments. Nothing for me was not like I, I didn't, I n- never thought about getting paid to, to show moves, <laughs> and and I've been showing sometimes techniques for like hours because athletes been asking me. They've been participating. Uh, we've been bouncing back and forth situations, technical situations. I mean, this is just clinical type of coaching, not really coaching what I do now. Um, I've been working for hours, and I had some of my friends said, Ivan, what are you doing, man? You've been here for five hours, and like, you're not tired? I said, no, not tired, because these guys, we're bouncing back and forth ideas, and it's interesting for me, and they're motivating me because they want to learn, and we're going back and forth, and I get some ideas. For me, it's not really a work, um, and I like to help people. This is another skill that I probably discover later. I, I like to help people. I, I, I wanted to help them, and I feel like if you're not a giving person in that area, it's, it's very hard to, to succeed if you if you kind of stingy, like, oh, I don't want to give him anything. I don't want to show him everything, right? I was just showing, <laughs> but at the same time, we bounce back and forth ideas, and um, it was... I, I, it's not fun, but I mean, it's not like work. You yeah. understand? It's it's just it's just something that I feel that the coach yeah. has to have and, to be able uh, to help people. I imagine this incredibly important. I think you touched on that 
that energy that comes back from the athletes, people you're trying to help, they, they have to be willing to receive? Absolutely. It's, it's always, I, I say that it's a partnership. Because if you're just always only showing and they don't respond, sooner or later you're gonna the coach will say, ah, these kids are not coachable or they don't believe, they don't trust me, maybe I'm not for them, or they're not ready for me, you know. But when you see athletes responding well, that's that's a good, fair partnership that it builds great relationship uh, between coach and athlete. And if you look at there's a many training systems, many training methods, many different approaches what coaches are due. But one thing is so important for all of the successful coaches, some way how they find a way how to convince their athletes to believe them, to trust them in the process of training. You know, so that I think that's that's it's very important. Yes, and I think we'll we'll touch on that uh, further because I, I want to kind of hone in on that point as well. But um, as far as you, the influences on your coaching go so what what contributed to you so you mentioned you had excellent coaches of your own so at an early stage of your coaching career i suppose you took a lot from from your coaches who who, who gave you a lot um i think in the, in the several conversations that we had you mentioned your how good your coaches were when you were kind of going through the coming up through the ranks uh, in wrestling uh, but at different stages, so early, let's, if, we, if we split them into kind of early stage of your coaching career, kind of mid-stage and then latter stage, so what are the top contributing factors that shaped you as a coach? Well, if I have to start very at the beginning, how I decided to start coaching, my coaching career was, see, I started my coaching journey after I retired after 1996 Olympic Games. Uh, I started my coaching journey from the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, working with adults, athletes, you know, those guys who already wrestle at the world level. And if you watch, if you have some experience, if you have some knowledge about the athlete, retired athletes, you see the majority of them are like, so like, they're so ambitious to take the top jobs, right? to go right away with the senior level national team. Um, I've watched this in my career when I was in Bulgaria, and I know some some coaches that were coaching me when they, they were going after that job, and they get it, and then later they fail because of lack of experience. And you know what, when they fail, I don't see them coming back. That's the scary part. So I realized that if I really want to have successful coaching career, I have to start in the United States working with grassroots. I have to study the American system. And that, not, that was not just my opinion. Um, I was talking a lot with Steve Frazier, who is the national coach, and um, he advised me to just be patient here, study the system. Steady, we're not like what you have in Bulgaria or in Russia or in other countries. And I realized that too. Um, and, and he advised me not to get frustrated about, you know, wrestling here, three styles and all of these. And I, at first I was frustrated. I said, this is how you guys even thinking to win, you know, you have to focus on one style and all of this. So anyway, I had to study. So I accepted a job working with grassroots in Salt Lake City with kids that are at first were like 15 years old, 15, 16. And then um, we started with even younger athletes, younger kids, like eight, nine, 10. And um, I started to study the coaching process from, from, from there. And then gradually I was climbing. The, the kids who, are, are, who I was coaching, I was 15, 16 years old, became juniors, you know, uh, 17, 18. I was able to put some kids on the world team in cadets, uh, some kids on the junior team in juniors. And we had, I had some national champions coming with the youth age. And those years, I really, really start learning about coaching. And you know what? And I have a great confidence about it because I pass that class. Later, when I moved to the Olympic Training Center in Colorado, in, sorry, in Michigan, in Marquette, Michigan, I had the opportunity to work with athletes 
um, right after high school. So that was the next level of athletes. So I started to, to study that age division and working all the challenges that I had in the United States. We never had athletes training only one style until we get them in, in that program in US, USOEC. And, and that, that actually helped me pass another class until these guys stay there with me for three, four, uh, even five years. And then they were ready. They became the top seniors in the nation in Greco. And that helped me to pass another class, you know? So, and then I, now I say I coached all the levels. I only haven't, well, actually I'm wrong. I want to say I never coach veterans, but I did this year. <laughs> Mitko Georgiev, one of my guys, you know, the instructors. Yeah. He wrestled in veterans and, um, in Las Vegas and won a first place, but you know, we, we didn't do much work with him anyway. But uh, I do have experience now in all the levels, and that gives me confidence that I, I have my opinion now. Yeah, and it's um, I think a lot of people will be familiar with the kind of similar concept what you spoke about, kind of people trying to jump from a top level athlete career into top level coaching straight away. You know, a, a prime example would be something like football, like in England, Premier League and, you know, top players finishing their career super eager and through some a bit of PR, a bit of inexperience of the managers, they get thrown in right at the very top, right at the very top. And every, obviously the expectations are such that, you know, they're going to succeed. They were a great player. They're going to succeed as a great coach with the top level team. And oftentimes, more often than not, they, they fail. And this is such a hard way towards the comeback from that point of view, from, from that point onwards. And uh, and the best ones, the ones that do succeed following the, it's not that, you know, if you're a top athlete, you can't succeed as a top coach, but they generally do start from grassroots. They go back to the academies, they go back to the keys, they prove themselves at all these different levels to eventually get charge of the top teams. And I think it's very similar to what you described there, going to the grassroots, working with the kids, proving yourself at the level, moving up the level, moving up the level, and then you get trusted and that's how you develop trust as well, I suppose, with, uh, with yeah. the top guys. Yeah, building experience in, in each age division. Uh, definitely will give you more confidence and better understanding about the coaching process. Um, you'll see um, there's a one way you teach the little kids, seven, eight years old. There's another way you, you teach in between 16, 15, 16 years old and another way how you teach like 18 years old and older kids. And it's it's a different approach slightly, you know, and, and you the only way to really understand this is by working years of experience um you're right most of the most of the champions are going after the big title the big the big position right um i think it's in my opinion they need to be more patient i mean they can be there but also it's good to study also from the bottom especially if you have a, a if you have a position like a national coach or some very top position uh, for me, it's it's a must to go to down. You know, it depends on the a national coach position. If you're if you just, it depends. You know, if you're a technician or but you should know how the kids are learning. You should have experience working also with different age groups. It, it will definitely be a advantage. And also, I think you learn to deal with different challenges at those groups. Yes. Um, that maybe less risky at those levels as well if you let's say if you if you're making some coaching mistakes or maybe handling or mishandling certain situations and the, the tensions inside inside the camp um obviously the the cost of that making that mistake and fixing that mistake is a little bit less at the lower levels because if you, if, the, if that's the first time you encounter that that tension and that situation right at the very top the the cost of that can be can be drastic so I think going through and making mistakes and correcting those mistakes at lower levels allows you to then better deal with them uh, at the top level. Um, another question I have for you and kind of what uh, what you spoke about there about studying the system. Um, 
when you talk about studying, how much of that is kind of theoretical studying where you take information, you know, how things should be in coaching. Okay, this is how you should coach. I don't know, you read a book, you study a course, this and that versus um, experiential learning, experiential studying where you actually get stuck in, make mistakes, correct mistakes, take notes. So how was your studying process? What, what, do you, what, what did your studying process consist of? Yes, um, my studying process was um, pretty simple for me um, to figure out how I'm going to start my coaching career. How, what I have to first know myself, what I'm going to be teaching. And I knew, I knew my strengths and I knew my weaknesses like everyone else. Um, I knew that my strength is teaching backstep throws, back arch throws, variations of gut wrenches, variations of front headlocks, uh, variations of counter attacks, defense. That's my kind of rough, like kind of give you kind of idea. Uh, I was able to have a good understanding, identify what is my style going to look like when I coach, especially I'm talking about greco Roman wrestling. I can say a few things about freestyle and folk style because my club is doing the three styles. We have to, we're working in a club environment. But right now for Greco, which I had the most international success, is I had to identify what is my style is going to look like, which techniques I have a very good understanding how to teach, right? And that's how I was able to make a plan of what I'm going to follow. And based on just, this is just an example with my technical part. Then I needed to select exercises that benefit my style, my techniques, my technical style on the mat, my, my athlete's performance, strength, conditioning that needed to execute better my mess, my wrestling techniques that I teach, that I work, because there there could be the techniques are on the, in your hand, but how many combinations, right? Is it, everybody's doing different way? Also, we have different athletes with different height, strength, you know, different flexibility. You know, you have to establish very um, individual styles, right? So I had to I had to think about that as well and select exercises that will benefit um, uh, my style of teaching, the, my style of coaching and, and training. For example, my style in the physical part was aggressive style. My style was is, is it still is. We do lots of pulling, tie-ups. We never, no, normally it should not break from a point. A consistent pressure, always. You have to have a hold, you have to have a hold, you have to have pressure. And you have to have ability and, and the right preparation to explode after certain seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds. You need explosive action, explosive action, either back arch throw, back, up, back step throw, off balance action, you know, but you have to have explosive action until you get down, your partner down on the mat, the opponent down on the mat, and then you have to perform either powerful turn or a lift and you need explosive power. So all of these I had to consider to create exercises or drills with partner or specific string condition exercises for explosive specific power or strength, specific strength that benefits. Everything is to benefit conditioning, everything to benefit the style of coaching I do. So it's nothing, and that's how Suplex came. I had, I had to come up with products that benefit my style of wrestling. It's not about, oh, how can I have these back to beat them down, you know? Uh, yeah, th th you could do that too. <laughs> it's easy, no, no brain. I can crush someone, I can, I don't even need the Bulgarian back. I can get this chair that I'm sitting and I can make someone tired, but is it appropriate? No, the back gave me exactly what I needed. The grip training, these rotations. This is now, now we have hundreds of exercises on these bags. And you and I sit down here, bring the bags, for example. We can come up today with two, three new exercises. Do I need all of them? No, I still stick with 
what are these four, five, six, uh, ten exercises that benefit exactly Ivan Ivanov's super style of wrestling? These exercises I need for muscular endurance, these exercises I need for speed and power, but all to benefit my athlete's performance on the mat. Period. That that's the that's that's the way I can explain. Does that make it kind makes, of sense? makes a lot of sense and I think you mentioned a few times the style, so it's almost everything you start with the outcome rather than you know trying to make entertain somebody or make them tired or this or that you start with the outcome this is the style this is what we need to have at the end of this process and now we need to find the whether it's exercises routines processes that will eventually feed in and at the end we get the style of wrestling which it produces outcomes then so and again uh, i really liked what you mentioned kind of going within yourself as a coach and identifying your strengths. What are you strong at? Because if you if you go with your, I mean, you can try to correct your weaknesses, but if there's strengths, especially, I think that's where the um, high level competitive background helps as well, because you know these things pay off. You know these things pay off in the competition, and then you can say, okay, these are my strengths. I can deliver them, I can teach them. How do we supplement them? And at the end, we get the style that we like. Absolutely. Everything was to, to benefit um, my athlete's performance on the mat. But I'll say again, my athletes, that's the next, the, next, the next biggest challenge I had or motivation to be very effective it is in the group training. Not to train only one athlete because you have a partner. Now, many people, you and I talked on the way here, we talked about, yeah, specific strength and brute strength training and we also talked about specific or oh, i right now resting specific resting specific strength training that you rely a lot on your partner and that that takes a coach with a whole lot of skills you know level of good understanding how to keep the athletes on the task especially when they sparring because i tell you what the 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 biggest the, the most essential part of the preparation you, you, you need, and I, I, I will say this for your sport too, and even I don't know jujitsu like you know it, sparring partner. How many times we all been really frustrated with some partner that just is not either not our level or don't have understanding or don't care or either doesn't really l- want to learn how to sparring correctly or has a wrong understanding about how to partner. Some of, have you had somebody, sometimes someone say, oh, I don't want to be a dummy here. Well, dude, you're not a dummy because you're a dummy only if you think that way. You got to, here, he's on offense, but you have to fight off his his position. So you, you get something for you always. doesn't matter what position you put me in. I need to benefit as, as, as much as I, if I'm offense or defense, it doesn't bother me. I need to get the best from me in that position. And there's always, you know, ways how to train that. So there's a there's a lot of, you know, different different ways, uh, routines, how we can structure to benefit really the most from training with partners yeah. versus just just uh, tossing equipment around, you know. Yeah. I, so I'd like you to expand a little bit more on that point of an, especially different dynamics and how as a coach you have to adapt from training a, maybe an individual or a small group. I think it's quite different training two people, for example, having like a, almost like a private session with two people and bringing somebody up versus training a full room. And I think uh, how many people, I think you mentioned this before, how many people did you have to coach the first time you came into kind of training in the Olympic training center? about 40 people and on your own as a coach. So that training a group, how does that differ in the dynamic and how do you have to adapt as a coach? versus training one or two people? Well, training one or two people, it, it's, it's, not as, it's not as hard as training like over 20 people. Um, 20 people, we have different levels. I mean, think about it, the USOEC when I was coaching, every year I have freshmen coming. The same time, my top guys were moving ahead. They were ready to win world medals. Um, I have one assistant coach 
But the assistant coach between us, we had the assistant coach also had to help me with lots of paperwork, and I had to make it work sometime. I mean, it was very it was very challenging, especially the first few months until you give the freshmen some fun day, fun, just teach them some some basics that they can be a, a better partners. They can uh, uh, watch for preventing potential injuries that you lose one of your freshmen and you don't have no one one partner less for example because he's injured because you didn't teach him how to um, land or pause correctly so they doesn't get hurt I mean these are all very it's very challenging situations and um, it, it needs uh, needs experience needs work in there um, I'll give you an example how I mostly handle this um, just maybe can give an example or give ideas to other coaches. For example, on the two mats, I would have worked mostly, I will take the technical part, most technical part that, because I'm in charge of the program mostly, my assistant is there to help me. He has to follow my instructions. So I work on the technical part, but at the same time, I. I move my top guys to the next mat, which I can take a pick at what happened, and I give the plan to my assistant coach to crank them, to train them. They're not like, I mean, they're drilling, but in a very intense mode, whereas these guys that I train the freshmen, we can, we can talk, we can slow it down, we can break it down. It's not as intense, not life wrestling. These guys got to wrestle life. And every once in a while, they need a partner. I send one of the freshmen go there, come back. I continue teaching. So I can keep, kind of have to know how to keep everybody happy. Not like, oh, leave the freshmen and just focus on these guys or send my assistant coach that doesn't really understand this yet or he's not, we, he hasn't studied this process. If he's ready for that, yeah, I can. I can let them run that part, but um, I found out that I need to need to be in charge of the the most technical part that I have much more experience until I make sure my assistant coach or coaches understand that. Then I give it, give them this. But they can blow the whistle, they can crank them. This is easy. Just keep them on the task. This is what they should you should watch for. What they're not doing, coach them. And then every once in a while, give them the other part too, so he can learn also how to do the instructions. But at the same time, I um, I was able to see that everybody liked this environment because the head coach was paying attention on everybody. This is the tricky part. It's a lot of work, lots of work. Everybody wants just to blow the whistle, you know, and just go. And if you don't perform, a lot of the coaches will show you the doors. But I I couldn't do that because there was not enough recruit I, not only that but i just this is not really fitting into my personality into my style of coaching and i was able to find the positive thing of every athlete that i have as long as he's coachable every athlete was helpful to my program if it was not he was just i would not invite him back they know that but if they're coachable they're training even with less skills they're helpful so that was the biggest challenge to the, the group training it's <laughs> yeah we spoke a few times on, on this topic and um i also through through my experience with you I've, i found so one of the one of the things that characterizes you the most in your coaching is the meticulous structure and planning so you talk about a lot about planning so but even what you said there you know delegating you know certain responsibilities to the assistant coach at a certain time but you have to understand the dynamics of the room you have to understand what your plan is with this room so talk to me a little bit about the importance of planning the the the, the cycles of planning and and how does that contribute to running an effective room especially when it comes to group training absolutely um planning is essential especially when you train performance performance i mean you want national champions you want world medals world champions you have to understand first the training process you have to understand the periodization in order to have to structure effective plan for certain like cycles you know three week cycle six week months or you know depends on what phase you are so you have to understand periodization very well 
and then you'll be able to uh, uh, structure a, a, a appropriate plan. Um, but um, uh, mostly, I'll say it's important to have a, a good understanding about not not only, for example, oh, he shows moves very well. He lo he knows a lot of techniques. Well, you can't only show moves. You have to know how to structure routines. So these guys going in there and, and, and wrestle in these similar situations that you test them in your gym before you bring them to the event, to the championships, whatever, right? You have to structure routines to keep them on the task. So you can't only show moves with, oh, you throw me, I throw you, for example. Uh, it doesn't work. But you also cannot wrestle them live and beat them down like crazy, you know, all week. You got to also spend time to drill and correct the techniques that you've been working or they've been working on. And that's, that's how you, you're able to uh, structure a more effective plan when you have a good understanding how much instructional, how much live, how much I need to also spend on specific strength and conditioning training, how much mobility and flexibility and workouts that prevent injuries I need also to implement in my plan. How much recovery that don't do nothing, like like one practice a day or a day off or or a sports game even, you know, how many of those? These are this is a tricky part. It takes takes someone with knowledge how to properly dosage the whole, you know, amount of a volume, a volume of intensity or, or a volume of training and, and how to split intensity and and just like like brute volume of, of training, how much lifetime, how much how much drill time, you know, this is, this, uh, this has to be studied and that's not very easy to, you got to spend a lot of years and, you know, go on and, and talk to, you need help. I, I needed help too. I was learning from, from good coaches. I was watching how they're planning. Sometime I'll tell you example, you know, <clears throat> I learned from my coach. He came one time. He said, today will be short and intense, like without, without the, the warm up 20 minutes workout. I was like, 20 minutes, what do you get for 20 minutes? Nothing, you know, but those 20 minutes, <laughs> it could be intense run, sprint, intervals, you don't need more. And, uh, and that's it, you know, so that's, that's an example of understanding what you're doing and your, your activities, because, um, if you don't, uh, if you just work on just general plan, either you could overtrain your athletes, or you can maybe I say undertrain them, right? Undertrain maybe yeah. is the same, <clears throat> the same word. So that's the tricky part. That's why I'm sitting down and writing my course now. Everything what I've done and I learn from it, I write it down, and I want to be able those guys who following Suplex wrestling, especially now I started with Greco to have a basic like a plan model like oh i have to i have to consider that at least to see it i write i'm writing it down i'm this is this is the, i'm in the stage of my life now i just prepare my my priorities how can i be effective coaching my own coaches that i have on stuff on my stuff this is it everybody else is welcome you know to learn from me but i must learn my i must teach and train my own coaches that I invested and pay full-time salary to be on my coaching stuff. They have to know what exactly I'm doing. It's not like with me, oh, here you go. I don't want to teach you how to coach. No, you, I have to show If you're my assistant, I have to show you what, what I'm doing. And not, I'm not telling you, you must do like only my only Ivan's way. No, no, not at all. You use this and contribute to my plan that we are both partners. We're both working together. I'm not telling you, you only have to go like a, a horse with, what do you call these, blanes, right? No, not at all. You got to open and you got to contribute to our plan. That's how we did it in, uh, with the backs, remember? I learned one exercise from you. You learned probably five, six from me or more, you know, and every year I come here, I learn something from you. That's how we grow, right? So I hope I was able to give you a little bit. No, that, that's 
again, that's something I've experienced and through our conversations over the last couple of days. Um, I think the amount of times you mentioned the word partnership, but in a true sense of partnership as a collaboration. So it's not a pure uh, in to a certain extent it is a top-down approach where you have to kind of disseminate information the approach you experience obviously the more experienced you are the more you can give people who are trying to follow your footsteps but preparedness and openness to listen and to say you have the reins you have the opportunity to contribute to this it's not it's not a closed book we don't we haven't finished writing that book you started and then you find the right people to follow you and to contribute further. And we keep writing that book and we keep writing that book and we keep writing that book, making improvements, making additions to this. And um, so that was kind of my, you, you preempted my next question is how you spoke a lot about also the style and the style some somehow also depends on the personality as well, I suppose. Um, so how do you, do that already and plan doing in the future to make sure that the coaches that follow you in the, specifically in the superless training systems, as you said, other coaches are welcome to to view and you know adopt some of these methods. But when we talk about superless training systems, wrestling, superless training systems in wider kind of you know fitness methods, you know you're talking functional about training. functional training. Yes. So how do you make sure that? Uh, there is a style. The style remains. The style obviously expands a little bit depending on, on, on people. But uh, that education, so obviously that we, we, we do certification courses and such, but the coaching approach and the coaching philosophy and the coaching style remains as, at the core of, of this. So what, what are your plans? What are your thoughts on this? Well, my thoughts are, uh, I've been very open with everybody when I go and teach um, mostly functional training. I, I share this to uh, my partners who are instructors like like you are um, and delivering the, the education uh, f for us, you know, like we're working in partnerships. I said, guys, I did my job with, like say, for example, with the Bulgarian back. I, I created, I made a system with this back and I stopped and I moved to the next one when I pass it to you guys. Now take it from here and keep building. You contribute to this. It's not only like this is it. it there is no limits. But I need to move to the next one until I have more, you know, something work here, right? <laughs> I, I better use, well, what's next? What's next? Because someone needs to do this job. You're, you're, you're smiling when I come to you like I brought you on my next tool. You like it. You like the, the Hertz Blaster, right? It was a nice surprise, right? Yeah. Like, wow, you know, every time it's like Coach Ivan comes, it should be like a Santa Claus. Bring always new, it, it, maybe not a new product or new equipment, but also a new routine or something like, oh, I never seen that. I, I like to learn, you know, like what's next? And I have to work on my, uh, on my tasks, right? So that's how I see we're moving forward as an organization, as a community. Someone in my position, right now it's me, you know, uh, if I'm not here, someone else have to come to this position. Always, always to move with new new innovations. But the, the coaches should study the system that they decided to to educate on, you know, like the Bulgarian back and at the moment. And the, you're also um, teaching suplex ball, for example, right? Um, later, the Hertz, you know, and, and all of these tools. And, um, and I keep moving forward and then i bring new equipment hopefully next year and that way we're all growing um and, and it works very well and at the same time um everybody has the this opportunity to to upgrade what we currently have because when we share this system with more many people definitely you're gonna have some some more people to contribute with ideas. Uh, some ideas don't work. Some exercises uh, we can't accept. You know, some exercises we will, but at least you're not. I don't want to make my partners think, oh, this is only Ivan's way. No, it's not. I actually got it done. This, you guys, it's yours. 
Let me move to the next one. And you guys, but you guys make sure you're not passive. Bring me some ideas back. Yeah. So it's a, a lot of, a lot of it, I suppose, is trust, trusting people to do things, trusting but also people. engaging with people. And, and engaging, they have to feel like, oh, I'm also allowed to give ideas. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're valuable. You're a partner. Right? I'm not here to motivate, like you mentioned, the motivation, you know, I'm, I don't like to sit down and only motivate people. Maybe I know how to do this well, but I, I, I rather work with people that already motivated. If you call yourself a partner of, with me, you better show me that you can motivate me too. How you motivate me? You know, like I give you an example. You're a coach. You're a, you have a jujitsu big club here in Dublin, one of the biggest probably. Do you have favorites? Am I asking you a question now, Peter? Do you have favorites? Do I have favorites? Yeah, do you? I probably do to the extent that, you know, if I, if I no, see... No, you do. You do, Peter. No, don't be shy, okay? Because ask me. I say, I have favorites. Always have. Always, always, always. And I always will. You know what? You know, I'm not shy to tell them. I can tell If they're right here, I'll say, you know what? I can tell you who is my favorite. Some coach is like, oh, he's going to say who is here. i tell you who is favorite, guys. I'll tell you right now. Okay, listen to me. If you're coachable... If you are busting your balls for the club and for yourself and for for your parents, for everybody, if you're coming to practice on time, if you're giving your best, if you're winning the most medals, you are my favorite, no doubt, no doubt. You are my. If you're one of those, then you are my favorite. If you're not, then you have the answer. You're <laughs> down the the latter. This is it. When talking performance, right? When we talk like, oh, we, if we have kids or athletes coming for activities, but the same, they come, they pay or they pay and they don't show up. That's not, mm, sorry, they're not, they're, yeah, they, that, well, they're performing. It's okay. Their, their activity, their activity, it's okay, you know, but still it's not okay because you pay and you don't show. <laughs> I don't understand that. Parents pay and they don't show to. I don't know if you have any of those. We do have in America. Maybe maybe they have so much more, money they don't care. <laughs> more but, more adults than kids. They, yeah. yeah, more adults. Okay. But, you know, I, I'm talking just performance, guys. Guys who told me, I want to be this. They talk a lot. You know, when we say, I wanna, I'm going to go. I coach. I watch. I win the National Saudi. And, you know, it doesn't come to practice. And now, you know, th those guys... Uh, you have to talk with them and, and I have to tell them that, sorry, but if you're not one of these, um, you're not my favorite. <laughs> they know. Yeah. So. It's a, it's in, in a way, it's a, it's a very transparent thing. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not a favorite based on some kind of subjective factors. It's transparent. So you asked me, I had to kind of, while you're talking, I had to think like who, who my favorites are. And, and generally speaking, it's, it's people who put the most effort in. Exactly. No, yeah. I knew, I knew exactly what, yeah. that you have favorites. I, I tell you, if somebody coach say I don't have favorites, he's lying. Yeah. But it's they, the all, they won't tell it, but see, I, I said it in a nice, delicate way. I didn't say names. They know. They're smart enough to know if they're my favorites or not. Because performance. I yell all the time. You know, I'm I'm the biggest yeller. In the gym, though, because people come to me in the corner. I said, Coach, can I can I sit by you and just listen what you how you coach? I said, Yeah, you're welcome, but I, I don't say much here, you know. First if I don't see communicate, I mean, connection with the athlete, sometimes some athletes just just don't listen. Even if you train them, like they go out there, like they look at you, hey, you know, tell them the name, hey, you do this, or yes, coach, yes, 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 sir, yes, sir, and he is focused somewhere else. I can tell he doesn't understand exactly what I'm talking about. So then I I could be like, okay, I don't I don't say much. But you know who I yell? Actually, I do yell sometime. I yell for a very inexperienced athlete. <laughs> because you, you coach him every, every move. He doesn't know nothing. And you have to yell and say, hey, do that. No, circle around. Grab the arm. Or move this. Face him. You know, you have to say so much. And then and I lost my voice. But I, I know now I, I, I leave this to my assistants, you know, to coach. Um, but 
but uh, yeah so the, the the healthy dose of that and the the energy i i look at it as a as an energy output from coach as well uh, as you said sometimes people like to just you know whistle once in a while maybe not even use a whistle just say a few things or or keep the room quiet i think in in in, in suplex we like to to keep that energy to keep that fire burning i can say something about this um i talk a lot in my course about building your own style your identity this is this is amazing this is very important uh, and i recommend this for each club organization to think about the identity identity you know like okay i'll give you an example everything what we do in the gym besides just training is one thing this is how we train right but when how you present yourself on the mat in competition do we walk after each action out of bounds do we walk or do we run first do we get first on the on the center or last on the center for example you know that's that's the question i don't say which one is wrong i i can tell you that i i prefer running and then i'm the guy who likes intensity like this is our identity this should be our athlete should be taught this way run to the center don't walk you know you're not walking in a funeral you're there to fight you know you're going you're not walking slow like in a funeral you know you you got to run back get back get ready this is our identity shows shows energy this guy is not a quitter you don't even think about getting tired you know this is our identity we don't say rest we say celebrate celebrate and that means after each set or whatever you do you jog and jog and jog and jump around like a little bit you know like shake your arms and move and you know like it's proven that you recover faster than after the match and sitting down or or after each action you put your hands right here oh come on i will just crush my guy don't put your hands on your knees you know how they bend down like or they put their hands right here show hey, yeah that's right show everybody that your arms are dead is that what you want then that guy is watching you and he's going to crush you right now if you show him these postures what is your posture okay what is the super coach should be what is our identity when we coaching he go in there and talk like this hey, let's go guys and post the wall no suplex coaches be squirting just by being around and just showing moving all the time showing energy the suplex coach should not be sitting down on the floor and flipping arms should be I mean, this is i'm just giving you kind of idea how what identity i mean what is exactly how you behave on the mat how you train how you end up the mat go shake the shake your, your opponent your opponent's hand first lose or win go shake the referees make sure you go in the corner and shake his coach's uh, hand as well you can't do that you know if if somebody is disrespectful i'll be chewing him up for example you know like or my coaches should be doing that so everything like that i can keep going on everything what we do see we never start practice without lining up this is our identity line up why because i don't want to be like a, on a power trip no i'm a structured guy i don't want, i want, i don't want to lose the control of my workout of my 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 training session i want to make sure the guys understand that i'm coming here with a plan prepared to work that's why i need them to line up i don't want them to sit down i don't say this is hey some people might say i i i will have them guys uh, sitting down on the phone you can do whatever you want this is your identity my identity i want them up i want them to watch me what i'm talking about what we're going to do by to do it's proven that they pay more attention when they up right this is our identity we don't start we don't we don't finish uh, we, we don't start practice without cheering cheering the name of your organization the the, the name the organization that you are rep representing after practice we will never finish practice like without a team cheer this is part of our identity you know so i can go on and on but this is this is very important for colleagues who are running clubs to consider this and that's um as I said that's something that that I've experienced with you and it's it it makes a huge difference and um kind of coaching philosophy and we go back to style philosophy so the underlying principles 
because you know there's tools and tricks and stuff like this you can do and you can you know watch an instagram video and say oh this coach is doing this and let me grab this this piece of information or this piece of information so they're like little gimmicks that can help for sure but there has to be an underlying style identity as you said or philosophy so whichever way you call it and everything comes back to that so does that does that action that you do is that consistent yeah. with your identity and sometimes maybe you do something that isn't consistent but it's you do it for, you can absolutely you yeah. should coaches should always do i can say experiments a little bit yeah. like okay test how this works i don't have to all you gotta you gotta make a little you gotta test something right you have to ex- explore some some new methods right and and take whatever works whatever doesn't you just oh this does not work and i'm not going to do it but uh but uh but i believe that if you run if you run a program and it want really results you kind of have to build your identity yeah that's 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 a really powerful message and the next thing i want to kind of bring us back a little bit um the overtraining undertraining part especially i think in at least in my community in jiu-jitsu there's it's almost like an accepted fact that the kids will burn out at some point if you you know if you push them too hard or, so, or something because such a long period you know kids start training quite early by the age by mid teenage years you know they get a bit of freedom maybe a little bit less structure because in the early days you know parents say you go you go to practice you know this day this time and you do that's what you do uh, as you get a little bit older you get a little bit kind of more personal freedom obviously you know maybe a little bit money a bit of this and that so a lot of kids kind of fall off the cliff in 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 the in the training sense okay so and i I spoke to you um, a couple of days ago about this and you said no my kids don't burn out so if if you if if that happens you fail as a coach so can you elaborate a little bit on that on that point and uh, how important is it to to again i think it probably goes back to planning um uh, what what are the key what are the key elements to making this work so you don't you don't have almost a certain burnout great question um understanding very good understanding about the planning is essential no doubt about this but also before that i will i'll start with something else when you starting a phase or starting career with an athlete this is what I, i i just say what i do i don't say this is this is only way right i just want to share here what i do that i have exper- i am experiencing success why my athlete is not quitting on me why i don't burn anybody <laughs> this is i probably am doing something right i sit down with them and first say all right johnny for example What is your goal, buddy? What do you want to do here? Now I move you. I just move you to super strong. This is my top perform not top performance before you go to world team. If you if you be called world team and super, you have to be on some of the world teams, Pan American world team, junior, cadet world team, you know, like you have to be somewhere. But super strong is my top team, right? My top level. You're we're about to move you to super strong. You know what that is? You understand? Oh, I understand. I understand, coach. Maybe he speaks. Johnny speaks back. Say, I understand, coach. I got to train every day. I have to go up to nine workouts a week. Yeah, that's right. Are you ready now for that? Yes, coach. You sure? Yes. Okay. What about your parents? Who's going to bring you here to practice in the morning, especially? Oh, I talked to my mom and blah, blah. Okay, good. So now we have a good understanding, Johnny. Okay, good. So everything what I ask you done. You know. Now we have a good understanding. Johnny is going to. It's going to follow the process. He gave me his words, right? I didn't twist his arm to be in this level. And now Johnny gave me his word and I structured a plan. So the first check check mark, right? Johnny gave me his word. Done. Now, that's not guarantee me that he won't quit, right? So now the next thing is a good understanding of how i structure my plan so i have different activity different training activities or or different ways of training but at the same time i don't want to cha- change the purpose of my training 
So for example, oh, we got to train strength. Every Monday we train strength. Yeah, every Monday mostly I train strength and power. Okay, but if you do it all year around, the kid's going to stop coming. They say, oh, it's the same. I know how to do this. or but. No, you don't because next week or two weeks, three weeks at the most, you're gonna, we're going to switch to something else, but never change the purpose of the train. It's still going to be strength, but different exercise, different equipment that trains the same area that benefits our super style of training. And see, you see the difference? And, and a, a mix a mixture with different um, different training, um, <clears throat> uh, different training, uh, not only the routines, but also on the mat. I'll give you another example. I always come in my in my serious phases of training when I know I can count on athletes to be here every day. I always come with a plan, folder, written plan by my hand because nobody. Even I can make grammatical misspelling. Nobody should look it without my permission here. This is just for me. And the athletes should not look. Even my assistant coaches, only if I decide to ask them, you know, to look, they can look at it, this, this manual. So I write the plan, and, um, and very often I, I can make the change. Because I see the guys today, they're not responding. But I also knew that yesterday, for example... I cracked them so much, so they probably didn't have a chance fully to recover. So I can change right away. Why? Because if I don't change, if I do this multiple times, I quickly can break them. And when you start breaking them, I mean, the force is not good for them. They're going to start doubting themselves. Oh, I'm not that good. Um, or you make him wrestle tired all the time. And some kids who are from the next level below, they come fresh. They come fresh. And they wrestle only two, three times a week. They practice and they go and score on these kids. And they and these top kids that are training full time, they start, oh, I'm not good. I train hard and I'm, I'm, I lost a point from uh, this young man who is not coming as often as me. And they start making a big problem, right? And that's not the problem. This problem is like if they're pushed to that limit, so now they're f fatigued, they're so tired. And the other kids can come close sometime, you know. Um, so I, I want to avoid any of these situations by having a very well thought training plan with activities that can get kids excited about each practice. They come to practice, they don't know what we're going to have. Most likely they guess what we're going to be on the mat or... Um, but also, I'll tell you, Wednesday, for example, that's the time when we can play sports game, when we can have interval training, something that it, it, it brings more excitement and changes the whole atmosphere, you know, in the room, or we can take them outside, do cross training that refreshes them. And sometimes, I'll give you an example. The parents are starting to get in, like, putting their their noses into like a tra try to be a coach and say ah they're gonna play they're gonna be outside we, we will go somewhere else so we can practice some freestyle for example you know it happened in my club and that's where they make the biggest mistake they go to another gym they still they still doing a lot of like mat stuff the kid never have time to refresh us a little bit and come back on the next day and be fresh and be like alert and and recovered and so that's that's i hope i i'm explaining yeah. you know the process how how i don't have any problems breaking them down you know like completely burning them out yeah so if, if if i had to summarize just for, for for my understanding as well because that's that's a lot of useful information for me as well um so it's obviously it's meticulous planning but planning flexible enough where you can change things when you see as a coach that you know with kids start breaking and generally the quitting will won't happen from one week of you know hard training it's the accumulation of that that keeps happening over and over and that will keep happening if you don't have a plan if you don't monitor that situation so it's one week like this second week like this third week like this and several instances of this mini burnouts will eventually you know result in in an in overall burnout and, and then the kid I can add something else that I didn't mention here. Um, burnout also could come from 
competing too much. And I'll give you an example in wrestling. <clears throat> America, the wrestling competition schedule is very intense because just the way it's structured. If you look at the competitions, they don't offer only Greco or freestyle. Most likely not. It may, may be some exceptions, but if you watch it, each competition, they got to wrestle one day Greco, one day freestyle, and then folk style. This very often is too much for some kids to handle. Some kids just not ready for this. And that's where the parents making a big mistake. They go and make the decision on their own. And that's where they're shooting themselves in the hills. The kid is not ready to handle that. The kid is not ready for one style. They want to push him on two or three styles just to get matches. And then the kid gets crushed, and that's immediately burnt out symptom right away. Don't you think? I mean, you're, you're crushed, you know, and would you want to go back? You, you don't want to, you don't want to see. It. I mean, it, it's tough. It's hard. So how do you find that balance? I talk to the parents. I started to, to talk with them, say, look, make sure at least let us know what you're planning to do. You know, so recently I had some kid just join the club, <laughs> take two months and they come and, I, and they go to the, the, the orig original competition that these kids are totally not ready. And I said, guys, at least let us know. I, I would tell you, I, I, I would tell you right away what I think, if you're ready for this or not. It's, yeah, if you want to go there, go, but at least I, I'm not stopping anybody. It's a club, right? I only can stop my son because I, I'm the parent. <laughs> so I can only stop my own child. But I, I just at least, I'd like to have a good understanding. You know, uh, I, I want you to give you my opinion. And and once we talk like that with the parents, um, things are way, way better. They have a good understanding and trust. And, I, and then they come to me more often and say, Coach, we, we, we are planning to, to send our child to this event. What do you think? And we talk about, you know, because um, I've seen some kids losing in one style and going in the other style, get, get crushed. But then the style before they won like a couple of matches at least. And then they go to the next day they get crushed, and they, guess what? Guess what? It's a, they're making the whole trip miserable. And then most likely you can lose the kid. I've seen it. That's how you break the kids. Competition is actually worse than the training because you go there and you, they go so much emotions, you know, and so we have to be careful, um, com especially when you wrestle like Three styles in America. I don't think you have this problem because you wrestle only jujitsu, right? They go, just go. Yeah, but there's there's Gino. You know, there's uh, there's almost the same. I, I can everything you're saying. I can see. I can. I have flashbacks to these things. I I see this. My own club, other clubs. It, it's it's very very relevant to me. So it's it's a, it's a really good piece of information. Good. I'm glad. At least I again I, I'm sharing my opinion. <clears throat> but um, um, at least you just have to have to communicate that with the coach and make together a decision. And if parents need to be involved, they have to be involved, you know, because parents at the end pay the money for a trip. Um, but they don't, sometimes they see a different way. Oh, we're going to take a family vacation. And uh, we, we, you know, they, vacation is vacation. You go to compete, it's a compete, right? I mean, it's good to mix it both. But in, in some cases, if, if, you have to see also if you if your child is ready for this, you know, or not. Excellent. Coach, we're going to wrap it up on this one. Uh, there's been so many gems in this. I'm going to rewatch this myself and I said pick up a few points. I'm pretty sure our viewers are going to do the same. And I'm also very sure this is not our last conversation in this format. So uh, many, many thanks. And um, yeah, we'll see you again. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. Same.